Be seated, please. Our interest has been greatly allowed by the subject of Brother Noah's talk, signs and wonders in the time of the end. We shall give our close attention to this important discourse by our beloved Brother Noah. What does it mean when more than 180,000 persons from all quarters of the globe come together for eight days and fill two giant stadiums of New York City, not far from the capital of the United Nations? Or what is this a sign in this day of world tension? that it is a wonder is certain, for here, in the midst of worlds stained with international difficulties, representatives from 123 nations, territories, and islands come together with a peaceful aim and mingle as members of one human family despite differences of race, color, language, national citizenship, and native culture. Thirteen years ago, on the opposite side of the continent in San Francisco, California, there were met together in discussion and activity 10,000 men and women representing 50 political states, of which 13 were European, 15 were Asiatic, Pacific, and African, and 22 were American. That San Francisco conference was a sign of international planning and was a wonder portending the establishment of the organization known as the United Nations. For the conference finished its work on June the 26th, 1945 with the signing of the United Nations Charter by representatives of 50 nations. But in July and August of 1958, this far grander gathering of representatives from many more nations serves as a sign and a wonder of higher importance to all mankind. This gathering convenes not to consider and serve the will of humankind, but the will of the Supreme One of the universe. The gathering is called the Divine Will International Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses. Because of the publicity attached to it, the eyes of all the earth are on this assembly, for people from all parts of the earth are here. Still to be viewed far more seriously is the fact that the eyes of the Most High God of the heavens are upon this international assembly. This assembly meets when this Bible scripture is true. The eyes of Jehovah are in every place, keeping watch upon the bad ones and the good ones. And again, Jehovah is in his holy temple. Jehovah in the heavens is his throne. His own eyes behold. His own beaming eyes examine the sons of men. Jehovah himself examines the righteous one as well as the wicked one. To him, the nations, including the United Nations, are as a drop in a bucket. What the political analysts or newspaper reporters and editors or religious criti uh, critics of Christendom or secular historians may yet say of this divine will international assembly does not concern us as being something to fear. It is not before mankind in general, nor before the many nations here represented, nor before the United Nations whose capital is nearby,
but before Jehovah God, the supreme judge that this gathering must stand condemned or approved. Why? Because it is with the divine will as our theme that we 180,000 have assembled. If we concentrate on furthering the divine will throughout God's green earth, this assembly will serve as a sign and a wonder from him, something that no nation or people on earth does well to ignore. <laughs> this is the most remarkable day of signs and wonders in all the history of mankind. We mean visible signs and wonders from the invisible God of the heavens for all men to observe. His signs and wonders, understood, portend that we are standing at the threshold of a peaceable, happy and life-giving new world. This is the grandest of news, although it means that we are living at the end of this worry-filled, problem-wracked, insane, loveless old world. We want the new. We are le eager to leave this old one. Men of Christendom and Jewry have ideas of their own as regards the signs and wonders that God ought to provide if they are going to believe. Today, such men are not different from what men of the Middle East were 19 centuries ago. A man who gave evidence of being God's only begotten son was there. His name was Jesus Christ of the family line of King David of Jerusalem. The two Jewish religious sects, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were doubters of who he actually was. They wanted supernatural proof, different from the marvelous miracles that he was performing. Once he fed 4,000 men, besides women and young children, from just seven loaves and a few little fish. Then the eyewitness report tells us the Pharisees and the Sadducees approached him and to tempt him they asked him to display to them a sign from heaven. He told them the one sign that would be given them. On another occasion he said to a crowd of people, this generation is a wicked generation. It looks for a sign. But no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, in the same way will the Son of Man be also to this generation. The men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it because they repented at what Jonah preached. But look, something more than Jonah is here. That something more than Jonah was Jesus Christ himself by reason of his experience and his preaching Jonah became a sign to the capital of the Assyrian Empire to the Jews of his generation Jesus Christ was still a greater sign not only was he a fulfillment of Jonah when Jesus was in the belly, belly of the earth dead for parts of three days and then resurrected but he was also a fulfillment of another sign man of ancient times, the prophet Isaiah, who lived some years later than Jonah. It was during the reign of King Ahaz of Jerusalem that Isaiah called attention to himself as a sign from Jehovah God. At that time, the very existence of the kingdom of Judah, over which Ahaz reigned, was in danger. In the crisis, Isaiah announced that he was a sign of tremendous meaning. Isaiah's name means salvation of Jehovah. He said, look, I and the children whom Jehovah has given me are as a sign and wonders in Israel. From Jehovah of armies who is residing in Mount Zion. In Isaiah's time, Egypt and the Middle East were in the news, just as they are today. 
Jehovah wanted Isaiah to be a sign against Egypt, to whom the Israelites were then inclined to flee for military help. From up north, the Assyrian king Sargon sent the commander Tartan against the Philistines, and Tartan captured their city Ashdod. Quoting from the scripture, At that time Jehovah spoke by the hand of Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go, and you must loosen the sackcloth from off your hips, and your sandals you should draw from off your feet. And he proceeded to do so. Walking about naked and barefoot, for three years Isaiah did that. Then Jehovah God explained this unusual conduct on Isaiah's part. He said to Isaiah, he said rather that Isaiah was a sign and a wonder to the Israelites in these words. Just as my servant Isaiah has walked about naked and barefoot three years as a sign and a token against Egypt and against Ethiopia, so the king of Assyria will lead the body of captives of Egypt and the exiles of Ethiopia, boys and old men, naked and barefoot, and their buttocks stripped, the nakedness of Egypt. And the Israelites will certainly be terrified and be ashamed of Ethiopia. They're looked for hope, and of Egypt their beauty. And the inhabitants of this coastland will be certain to say in that day, there is how our looked for hope is, to which we fled for help in order to be delivered because of the king of Assyria. And how shall we ourselves escape? Those of God's professed people who took heed to the sign and wonder that Jehovah gave in Isaiah to forewarn them of the defeat of Egypt and Ethiopia changed their minds by running down to Egypt instead of Jehovah for help and salvation. Isaiah's children, as well as he himself, were signs and wonders in ancient Israel. Who were these children of Isaiah? Of two, we can be certain. The first one was named Shear Jajab. That name, in itself, is prophetic. It means a mere remnant will return. This son was a sign, and his name was a wonder, a token, or portend. Just as certain as that son was born to Isaiah and was called Shear Jajab, just that certain was the event that his name foretold to happen. Isaiah called attention to this event prophetically. He said, It will certainly occur in that day that those remaining over of Israel and those who have escaped from the house of Jacob will never again support themselves upon the one, the Assyrian king, striking them. And they will certainly support themselves upon Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel, in trueness. A mere remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For although your people, O Israel, would prove to be like the grains of sands of the sea, a mere remnant among them will return. An extermination decided upon will be flooding through in righteousness because an exterminating and a strict decision the Sovereign Lord Jehovah of Armies will be executing in the midst of the whole land. The name, Shear, Jezeb, meant therefore that the kingdom of Judah would be overthrown, its capital city, Jerusalem, and its temple would be destroyed, the surviving Jews would be taken to Babylon as captives, and after a long period of time, a mere remnant would return to their homeland and rebuild their capital city and its temple to Jehovah. So serious was the situation to become about the survival of the nation of Israel that Isaiah prophesied. Unless Jehovah of armies himself had left remaining to us just a few survivors, we should have become just like Sodom. We should have resembled Gomorrah itself. Sodom and Gomorrah had been burned down by a rain of sulfur and fire from the skies. 
In becoming filthy like ancient Sodom and Gomorrah, the kingdom of Judah would itself suffer a destruction almost complete if it were not that Jehovah God spared a remnant of faithful Jews and in due time let them return to their homeland to rebuild Jerusalem and Jehovah's temple. This experience actually did come upon the Israelites of the kingdom of Judah just as truly as the fact that Isaiah's oldest son was born and was named Shear Jezub. Another son of Isaiah was named even before his conception, and the name was attested to by reliable witnesses. Isaiah tells us, Jehovah proceeded to say to me, Take to yourself a large tablet and write upon it with the stylus of mortal man. May her shall al hazbaz. And let me have attestation for myself by faithful witnesses, Uriah, the priest, and Zechariah. Then I went near to the prophetess, and she came to be pregnant, and in time gave birth to a son. Jehovah now said to me, Call his name May her shall al hazbaz. For before the boy will know how to call out my father and my mother. One will carry away the resources of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria before the king of Assyria. History records that Assyria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, had made spoil of and destroy and destroyed by King Shalmaneser in 740 BC, and the surviving Israelites were taken into exile into the land of Assyria and in cities of the Medes. The meaning of Isaiah's son, Meher Shalal Hazbaz, was literally fulfilled. This boy had thus served as a truthful sign and wonder. There was possibly another son of Isaiah, and this one was to be called Emmanuel. At that time, the king of northern Israel and the king of Syria had joined in conspiracy against the kingdom of Judah to dethrone King Ahaz, the descendant of the king David, and to put on the throne of Jehovah a certain son of Tabel, possibly a Syrian. This political conspiracy frightened King Ahaz, wicked though King Ahaz was. Jehovah God was not going to let the conspiracy succeed. To assure King Ahaz of this, he said to Isaiah, Go out, please, to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jazbub, your son. This is, where the Lord, this is uh, what the Lord Jehovah has said. It will not stand, neither will it take place. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is King Reason. And within 65 years, Ephraim, the leading member of the kingdom of Israel, will be shattered, shattered to pieces, so as not to be a people. Unless you people have faith, you will in that case not be of long duration. Then Jehovah said to King Ahaz of Judah, Ask for yourself a sign from Jehovah your God, making it as deep as Sheol or making it high as the upper regions. Faithless Ahaz refused to put Jehovah to the test. Then Isaiah said, Therefore Jehovah himself will give you men a sign. Look, the maiden herself will actually become pregnant, and she is giving birth to a son, and she will certainly call his name Emmanuel. Later, when telling how the Assyrian armies would overthrow Syria and Israel and even flood over into the land of Judah and threaten Jerusalem, Jehovah said to Isaiah, Look, Jehovah is bringing up against them the mighty and the many waters of the river, the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he will certainly come up over his stream beds and go over all the banks and move on through Judah. He will actually flood and pass over. Up to the neck he will reach. 
and the outspreading of his military wings will occur to fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. How was the name Emmanuel fulfilled? For the historical answer, we must move forward more than 700 years to the birth of the one whom Isaiah was a prophetic type. Joseph the carpenter of the Galilean city of Nazareth was hesitating about taking his fiancée Mary as a wife, for in some unexplained way she had become pregnant. In a dream, Jehovah's angel appeared to perplex Joseph and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, home, for that which has been begotten in her is by Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you must call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this actually came about for that to be fulfilled, which was spoken by Jehovah through his prophet, saying, Look, the virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means when translated, with us is God. In, on waking up, Joseph proceeded to do as told. In due time, Mary bore a son, and his name was called Jesus. At the age of 30 years, Jesus began to preach the kingdom of God. For his loyalty to God's kingdom, he was put to death. On the third day, Almighty God raised him from the dead, Forty days later, the Son of God ascended to heaven and sat down at God's right hand. From there, by the use of his human sacrifice and by the use of his great power in heaven and on earth, he went ahead saving his people, his followers on earth, from their sins that they might gain everlasting life in God's new world. Thus he has proved, even till now, that with us is God, and thus the name Emmanuel, Emmanuel properly belongs to him. For faith in this Emmanuel, even to a point of dedicating themselves to Jehovah God and following in the footsteps of his faithful son, Emmanuel, Jehovah has begotten 144,000 of such faithful followers and made them sons of God, his children. He makes these spirit-begotten sons the joint heirs of Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, in the promised kingdom of the heavens. In this way, they become the spiritual brothers of Emmanuel, God's royal son, because Jesus became the means of their everlasting salvation. Jehovah God gives these children of his to Jesus as a bride class and as a little flock of sheep to whom their heavenly Father has approved of giving the heavenly kingdom. Today, after these 19 centuries, merely a remnant of them remains on earth. Here let us remember that Jesus was a sign, just as Isaiah was a sign. The names Jesus and Isaiah mean the same except that in Jesus' name, God's name, Jehovah, is put at the beginning, and in Isaiah's name, it is put at the end. Jesus meaning, Jehovah is salvation, and Isaiah meaning, saved has Jehovah. Like their Savior and leader, Jesus' 144,000 followers are signs the remnant of them are signs to the generation of this time, the time of the end, the end of this distressed world. On what basis may we say this? On the basis of the prophet's words at Isaiah 8, 18. Under inspiration, the Christian writer of the letter to the Hebrews quoted these words and applied them to Jesus and his 144,000 disciples, saying, it was fitting for the one God, for whose sake all things are and through whom all things are, in bringing many sons to heavenly glory, 
to make the chief agent of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both Jesus, who is sanctifying, and those who are being sanctified all stem from one Father. And for this cause, he is not ashamed to call them brothers, as he says, I will declare your name to my brothers. And again, look, I and the young children whom Jehovah gave me. Hebrews, the second chapter. These young children are not the great crowd of other sheep to whom Jesus Christ the King will become the Father forever in the inhabited earth to come. The young children of God are those begotten of his Spirit to become his spiritual children. These Jehovah has given to Jesus. In prayer to Jehovah God, Jesus said, I have made your name manifest to the men you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. And they have observed your words. I make requests concerning them. I make requests not concerning the world, but concerning those you have given me, because they are yours. And all my things are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified among them. The Heavenly Father gives Jesus 144,000 of these young children, young children of God, to be his brothers in the spiritual family of God and to be his associates in God's work. What work? That of being signs and wonders on earth. Jesus said that he was a sign he also says that his spirit-begotten, spirit-anointed brothers must be signs and wonders also. To this very day, they have been. Hence, they must be like Shear, uh, Shear Hajbub, and like Meher Shalal Hazbaz. Jesus Christ himself is the great Emmanuel. His remaining spiritual brothers on earth today are the modern Shi'ar Jajab. The meaning of that Hebrew name applies to them. During World War I, they came into a captive state, being in bondage to the warring nations of Christendom, in spiritual bondage and in a physical way. Even the president and the secretary and treasurer of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society were arrested and imprisoned as a result of the passions of that global conflict. Those children of God were expecting that World War I would worsen into world revolution, and world revolution would turn into world anarchy, and that would spell Armageddon of all the nations of this world. But had that proved true, and had God Almighty unleashed the foretold battle of Armageddon at that time, these spiritual brothers of the greater Isaiah under their spiritual bondage to the worldly nations might have been destroyed with the nations. They might have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. But that God long ago gave Isaiah a son named Shear Jajab, which name means a mere remnant will return. To fulfill that name, Jehovah had to give Jesus Christ, the greater Isaiah, a remnant of young children, his brothers, who had returned to Jehovah's organization. Jehovah God did so. In 1918, he stopped the great tribulation that had begun upon the enemy organization of Satan the devil. Along with it, World War I ended on November the 11th of that year. His time for Armageddon, the war of the great day of God the Almighty, was still future. In this way, he cut short the days of that tribulation upon Satan's organization, invisible and visible. Then in the spring of 1919, he brought to his young children, to the remnant of those whom Jesus Christ confessed as his brothers, released them from their captivity to modern Babylon.
By means of their oldest brother, Jesus Christ, God caused them to return to his theocratic organization and its work. Thus a mere remnant, the truly dedicated, anointed young children of God, did return, and God gave them to the greater Isaiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus foretold that this would occur in the time of the end of this world. It did. And the greater Isaiah got his Shi'ar Jajab class. For some years during the post-war period, the return remnant increased, but recently their numbers have been getting less as many of them finished their earthly walk in Jesus' footsteps. Today, the remnant number is about 15,000, according to the records of April in 1958. However, let no nation of the world despise them and consider them as of no significance. Let not the sheep-like people look upon them as of no special meaning within the purpose of Jehovah God. This spiritual remnant stands forth as a sign to all the world. Like Isaiah's son, Shear Jajab of old, this spiritual minority is a visible proof from the Most High God that the remnant has returned. They are physical, tangible evidence that Jehovah God is faithful to his word and has fulfilled the prophecy long ago pronounced in his holy name. All men should watch this spiritual remnant as a sign from the Most High God. Yes, 780,000 sheep-like persons, other sheep of God's right shepherd Jesus Christ, have beheld this upraised signal. With joy they have hailed it. They have assembled under it, giving their undivided support to God's kingdom by Christ and placing themselves under its protection and under its commands. They have taken up the only religion, the only worship that is, that this heavenly kingdom authorizes or permits, the lofty worship of Jehovah God at his spiritual temple. Their gathering is a worldwide sign of the last days of this world. For in its time of the end is when Isaiah foretold that this would occur, saying, It must occur in the final part of the days that the mountain of the house of Jehovah will become firmly established above the top of the mountains, and it will certainly be lifted up above the hills. And to it... All the nations must stream, and many peoples will certainly go and say, Come, you people, and let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will instruct us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, law will go forth, and the word of Jehovah out of Jerusalem and he will certainly render judgment among the nations and set matters straight, respecting many peoples. And they will have to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning shears. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. O oh, men of the house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of Jehovah. So they associate themselves with Jehovah's signs and wonders in this very day. It is a joyful privilege for anyone to be a sign of something that is lastingly good. To people who have a right set of values, a person who serves as such a sign is something handsome, someone welcome and worthy of a hearty reception. So then a messenger who brings good news about the true worship of Jehovah God and about the reestablishment of a theocratic organization in the earth would be a handsome sign. Through his prophet Isaiah, Jehovah God describes such a, such a messenger as due to appear shortly after World War I ended while his witnesses were yet lying in captivity 
to the war mad nations of this world, he said, for that reason my people will know my name. Even for that reason in that day, because I am the one that is speaking. Look, it is I. How handsome upon the mountains are the feet of the one bringing good news and the one making peace to be heard. The one bringing good news of something better. The one making salvation to be heard. The one saying to Zion, our God has become king. Listen! Your own watchmen have raised their voice. In unison, they keep crying out joyfully, for it will be face to face that they will see when Jehovah comes back to Zion. Become cheerful, cry out joyfully in unison, you devastated places of Jerusalem. For Jehovah has comforted his people. He has repurchased Jerusalem. Those who were on the watch for the interest of God's organization, Zion saw the messengers as he came up upon the heights. They rejoiced to hear him call out to God's organization, Zion, your God has become king. His kingdom is established in the heavens in the hands of Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. That is the reason why he has now brought deliverance to us that is the reason why he has returned to us with favor. At the abundant evidence of Jehovah's return favor, it is as if a watchman saw him face to face in his coming back to Zion, his organization upon which he has placed his holy name. They have reason to cry out for all men to hear. Now, somebody equipped that messenger with the good news that made him appear so handsome. Somebody sent that messenger to make peace to be heard and to bring good news of something better and to make salvation to be heard by men who love God and who want him to be king. The sender is Jehovah himself who bears his holy arm before all the nations and who wants all the ends of the earth to see the salvation that he performs. The messenger that he sends is a company of people who are willing to go on foot and bring that good news. By inspiration, the Apostle Paul declared that they are the saintly dedicated Christians. To them he quoted the foregoing words of Isaiah 52, 7 as he climaxed his argument with the following words. There is the same Lord over all, who is rich to all those calling upon him. For anyone that calls upon the name of Jehovah will be saved. However, how will they call upon him in whom they have not put faith? How in turn will they put faith in him of whom they have not heard? How in turn will they hear without someone to preach? How in turn will they preach unless they have been sent forth? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who declare good news of good things. The great source of the good news of good things, Jehovah God, is the one that sends his messengers on foot to declare his message. The prophet Isaiah himself exemplified that fact. This was at the time that he had a miraculous vision of Jehovah of armies enthroned in his temple. When Isaiah heard the seraphs declaring the holiness of Jehovah, he felt so unholy and unclean that he feared for his life. At his outcry, one of the seraphs cleansed him, saying, Look, this has touched your lips, and your error has departed, and your sins itself is atoned for. After Isaiah was in this cleansed condition, he heard a voice asking for someone to be sent and to go on a mission. Whose voice was it? Jehovah's. And it was saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? 
Isaiah looked up and he looked upon this call as a high honor to be sent by Jehovah God and to go for him on a mission. What could be grander? The offer was open to a clean person that would willingly offer himself. Isaiah leaped at the rare privilege. Here am I, send me, he cried out. His offer of himself was accepted and he was told, go and you must say to this people, here again and again, O men. Isaiah being sent forth equipped with a special message meant that he was ordained appointed by God. By Isaiah, people could now hear the hear of God's name. They could put faith in God's name and call upon it in order to be saved. True to the example of Isaiah, who was a sign for ancient Israel, Jesus dedicated himself to the service of God's kingdom that he too might be sent. He left his carpenter shop at Nazareth and went to see his forerunner, John the Baptist. He got baptized. Not to symbolize any repentance over sin, for he had none, but in order to be sent out in the service of God's kingdom that John was preaching. His coming to be baptized fulfilled the words of Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. For the apostle applies those prophetic words to Jesus, saying, When he comes into the world, he says, You did not desire sacrifice and offerings, but you prepared a body for me. You did not approve of whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I, Jesus, said, Look, I am come. In the roll of the book it is written about me to do your will, O God. After his baptism by John in the Jordan River, Jesus received the evidence from heaven that he was accepted. The Bible record states, as he was praying, the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit in bodily shape like a dove came down upon him, and voice came out of heaven. You are my son, my beloved. I have approved you. Furthermore, Jesus himself, when he commenced his work, was about 30 years old, quoting from Luke and Matthew. Ah, yes. Then after offering himself as being baptized and receiving heavenly approval, Jesus commenced his work, not carpenter work, but kingdom work. That he did not go of his own self-appointment, but that he was sent. He repeatedly stated in words like these, God loved the world so much. God sent his Son into the world for the world to be saved through him. And again, I have come down from heaven to do not my will, but the will of him that sent me. And again, the living Father sent me forth, and I live because of the Father. Like Isaiah, Jesus, the Anointed One, did go, and he honestly applied to himself the very same service commission that Isaiah received at his temple vision. After Jesus began gathering his disciples, whom Jehovah of armies gave him, Jesus could call these children of God his brothers. Then, too, he could apply to himself and to them the words of Isaiah 8, 18. Look, I and the children whom Jehovah has given me are as signs and as wonders in Israel from Jehovah of armies who is residing in Mount Zion. Happy were the sheep-like people in Israel who correctly read the meaning of these signs and wonders not despising those human signs and wonders because they were few in number, a little flock. So happy readers become followers of Jesus, the true Emmanuel, the greater Isaiah, to prove by the Bible that he was sent by Jehovah of armies and therefore was ordained or appointed by him 
Jesus on a Saturday went into the synagogue of the city of Nazareth where his fellow citizens had known him only as a carpenter, the son of a carpenter. Mounting the speaker's stand, he called for the book scroll of Isaiah to be given to him. Unrolling it, he found the words of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. According to the account of Luke 4, 16 to 21, this is what Jesus read. Jehovah's Spirit is upon me because he anointed me to declare the good news to the poor. He sent me forth to preach a release to the captives and a recovery of the sight to the blind, to send the crushed ones away with a release, to preach Jehovah's acceptable year. When Jesus has rolled up the scroll and sat down to preach, he said, Today, this scripture that you just heard is fulfilled. In this way he became a living, speaking sign to them that the Messiah, the Christ, Jehovah's sent and anointed one was present. He became a wonder or portend indicating that deliverance was at hand for Jehovah's acceptable year was now come. He became a wonderful portend indicating that in him the king God's kingdom was in the midst of the Jews. That kingdom of God left the midst of the Jews after their religious leaders had had Jesus killed on the torture stake and God raised him from the dead and he ascended back to his father in the heavens. In the year 70 AD, the Jewish nation was destroyed. Their holy city and temple were burned and razed to the ground. What unhappy survivors there were. These were carried away captive into all nations, having no government of their own and with no king of David's royal family line. However, today, what do the signs and the wonders that Jehovah of armies has provided in this time of the end mean and indicate? How should men read them in the light of God's word? Today's signs and wonders are the remnant of the anointed spiritual brothers of Jesus. This remnant was foreshadowed by Isaiah's son, Shear Jajab, which name means a mere remnant will return. This mention of a remnant points up the fact that Christendom with its more than 820 million professed Christians, has not returned to Jehovah God since 1918. That year was when Jehovah came to his spiritual temple to judge all those who claimed to be the spiritual house of God, to the remnant of Jehovah's anointed witnesses who did return to Jehovah. He revealed his presence at the temple just as he did to Isaiah. When the remnant volunteered themselves, at his asking whom to send, Jehovah sent them as his witnesses with his message. Then with this modern Shi'ar Jajab on hand, Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, the greater Isaiah, would furnish the sign that the remnant had returned to Jehovah theocratic organization. As the Apostle Paul could say in his day, it can now be said, at the present season also a remnant has returned up or has turned up according to the choosing due to God's undeserved kindness. This remnant has its hundreds of millions of copies of the Holy Bible in many languages. Yet, since it reads the Bible from the standpoint of its creeds, it fails to see the judgment of God written down long in advance against it and against its friend, this world. What visible sign is there then to portend or indicate what Christendom fails to see, namely the divine judgment will speedily be executed on it and its friendly world? There is the remnant 
Emmanuel's spiritual brothers, the anointed young children whom Jehovah God has given to Jesus Christ, like him, their head brother, they have been anointed with Jehovah's Spirit to preach. By Jehovah, they have been sent, according to the prophecy of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. They have been anointed not only to call out the year of goodwill on the part of Jehovah, whose symbolic year has now almost ended, but also to call out the day of vengeance on the part of our God, which day is getting even closer. This vengeance will be poured out when Jesus executes the judgment of our God upon both Christendom and heathendom, both anti-kingdom. In proclaiming the speedy coming of this day of God's vengeance with its spoiling and plundering of the whole world by his King Jesus Christ, the anointed spiritual remnant have taken on the sign features of Isaiah's son, Meher Shalal Hazbaz. They are proclaiming, Hasten, O spoil! He has come quickly to the plunder. Multitudes of sheep-like meat people have seen and heard this sign and wonder, this Meher Shalal Hazbaz class, and have read the meaning of it correctly in the fullness of their belief and conviction they have taken their stand alongside this remnant of Jehovah's modern day signs and wonders more than that they have taken up the message of God's vengeance and have given it an increased spread to all the nations of the earth and for this the remnant are very grateful to Jehovah God and to all of you To be of any value and guide, signs and wonders have to be seen, that they may be studied, that their meaning may be read and understood with God's key of understanding. As signs and as wonders, the anointed remnant of Christ's spiritual brothers must be out in front to the view of the people. Then the greater Isaiah Jesus Christ can say, Look, I and the children whom Jehovah has given me are as signs and as wonders in Christendom from Jehovah of armies who is residing in Mount Zion. In order to keep up these signs and wonders, the great crowd of the remnants dedicated companions of goodwill must be out in front with them. To the anointed remnant of spiritual Israelites, Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, is the utterance of Jehovah, even my servant whom I have chosen. This servant class has to be seen. It has to let itself be heard in order to be witnesses of Jehovah. And in order to join with the anointed servant class in the worldwide witness work, the great flock of dedicated sheep-like persons has to be seen in union with them and let themselves be heard in unison with them. We must all be out in the open, conspicuous, to be seen, observed, heard. This is no time to hold up because of the anguish distress, fears, and threats of the nations of this world, said the great sign Emmanuel to his followers, you, all of you, you are the light of the world. A city cannot be hid when situated upon a mountain, said Isaiah of old. Make your way up even upon the high mountain, you woman, bringing good news of Zion. Raise your voice, even with power, you woman, bringing good news for Jerusalem. Raise it. Do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. As a minister, Jesus is not out of sight and inconspicuous as when he was a carpenter in Nazareth. 
as a great sign from Jehovah. He was seen in all parts of his territory by preaching, going from city to city and from village to village, preaching publicly in the synagogues and in the open and also in the homes of the people. Copying him, we also can be prominent. Now, not to show off, no, not at all, but to call attention to Jehovah's signs and wonders in this time of the end. Most effectively can we do this by preaching, not only publicly, but mainly from house to house. In this way, Jesus' prophetic words must be fulfilled. This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations. And then the accomplished end will come. This preaching of the good news everywhere, publicly and from house to house, by the remnant and their sheep-like associates, is in itself a most eloquent sign, a wonder, that excites the attention of all the world. It is undoubtedly undoubtable evidence that God's kingdom, in the hands of his heavenly Emmanuel, has been set up at the capital of the universe it is a sign that portends that the nations of this world now face their end and will meet it just as soon as our preaching is finished according to the divine will. Let them read the sign. The people in the nations must know that we have been among them and given solemn warning of their end. This may expose us to their abuse and their persecution. Yet, like the apostles of Emmanuel. We must become a theatrical spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Concerning Emmanuel, even when a 40-day-old baby, Simeon prophesied, this one is laid for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel and for a sign to be talked against. What then, if we are talked against and opposed as a sign or are challenged because of our preaching the straight truths of the Bible? We know whom we have backing us up. It is Jehovah of armies who is residing in Mount Zion. It is from him that we have the remnant of signs and wonders today and there are thousands of them here in this international assembly. Hence, <coughs> hence he will see to it that what these signs and wonders mean and indicate is truly fulfilled. Jehovah of armies is the one who has sent us and who has e equipped us with the good news of his inaugurated kingdom. His angelic armies, which exceed the combined armies of the Communist Eastern Bloc and the Democratic Western Bloc, surround us. They are fully organized and armed and lined up for the f at the field of Armageddon for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Let us not then fear man or devil. God, whose fear-inspiring name is Jehovah of Armies, is with us. The very name of his reigning King Emmanuel means with us is God. Since Emmanuel is with us because we are following and obeying him in preaching the good news of the kingdom for a final witness to all the nations, we know that God is also with us. That means that God is for us. With such divine help, and according to the divine will, we are certain to finish successfully the wonderful and significant work that Jehovah of Armies has sent us to do. So then on with the divine will International Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses. Some months ago, the Society mentioned that we were trying to print a smaller 
American Standard Version Bible, we success, succeeded in making it a little thinner. But uh, we thought after producing that it would be good to try to make an even smaller American Standard Version so that you could carry it around with you in the field service work. So during the last few months we have succeeded in making a pocket version of the American Standard Version Bible. Practically all of you have this very same Bible, word for word, page for page, but now we have succeeded by getting some specially made paper and running it on our presses to make it very much thinner and very much smaller. So those of you who need it in your field service work to carry along might want to obtain a copy of it this afternoon and it can be had on a contribution of one dollar and fifty cents from the ushers as soon as this meeting is dismissed. The report of this afternoon's attendance is at hand. At Yankee Stadium, the attendance of inside was 78,144. Outside of Yankee Stadium was 12,324. So altogether at Yankee Stadium, 90,400. 68. At Polo Grant, inside attendance was 55,118. Outside attendance was 5,417. Altogether at Polo Grant, attendance was 60,535. All total was 151,003. Let us sing song number 85. 